Hello everyone, I'm Drew Below Melchizedek, and we're here today to answer questions and answers again. <laughs> um, these questions and answers are coming from Facebook, and they've come in the last three or four hours, and they're all on the Merkaba. And so, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've been reading these questions, and you guys uh, have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, it's clear that you you really don't understand from most people here uh, what the Merkaba is. And so I'm going to do the best I can to try to explain this. Uh, I have a, an audio tape which will explain the history of the Merkaba and how uh, many things about it that, that aren't really understood out in the world too much. And so we're going to introduce that tape first and then these questions uh, that you have asked me right now will follow behind that audio tape. And so uh, I think between that tape and what I'm asking here today, I hope this really helps you more to understand uh, what the Merkaba is and its importance in the world. Okay, uh, now you, I've got names here from all over the world. I, I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce them all right, but I'll do my best. And this first one is one of the hardest ones ever. Uh, it's from a person that's spelled N-E-J-C. I'm not sure how to say that. Uh, but he says... Uh, is the Merkaba something physical, spiritual, or more of a thought form creation? Because I've been meditating on it a lot, but I still uh, didn't get to the bottom of it, which makes me go and research other stuff instead. Okay, well, the Merkaba is a very real thing in science. It is an electromagnetic field. It's not a thought form. Uh, it's not uh, uh, a, just a spiritual idea or a concept. It is an actual physical real thing in this third dimensional world. As it proceeds to other dimensional levels, it will change its nature. But here in the third dimension, it's, uh, uh, it is an electromagnetic field. This field sits at about four degrees Kelvin. That means about four degrees above absolute zero which also means that it's a very weak field. In, in energy-wise, it doesn't have a lot of energy, but its power is in its form, its shape, and how and what it does. Uh, the, the full Merkaba of a human being is more complex than just the, the parts that we are using today to create it. That, that is a, the part that we're using is a star tetrahedron. It's a tetrahedron facing down and a tetrahedron facing up. And that's the first shape that forms out from around the body. Around that is a sphere that exactly encloses it. And then it begins with many, many, many geometrical forms that go out to hundreds of thousands of different possibilities. And, uh, and it ends at about 55 to 60 feet approximately, depending on your height. It's, a proportion, it's always proportionate to the person's height. And, uh, and the complexity of that requires computers just to be able to see it and understand it. Uh, Russia is very deeply into this. Uh, they use it in their defense system and their military, and, uh, and it is, uh, uh, on those levels, it is the most powerful force in the universe. Uh, there is nothing more powerful, even though it's a weak field, there is nothing more powerful in existence in terms of uh, protection and, 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 and creation uh, and what a potential of what it is. The geometries that are in, around the body in the Merkaba are what are used to create the entire universe. And there is nothing, not one thing, in this entire universe that was not created through the geometries of your Merkaba. Even things that you wouldn't think. I mean, like if you look at crystals, it's pretty clear. You can look in there and you'll see that all the atoms will line up in geometrical forms and form crystals. It's totally a geometrical world. Or if you look at viruses, it's the same way. All viruses are geometrical and they are all, you can actually see them through the microscope and they're always geometrical. Uh, but there are other things uh, that you wouldn't normally think about, like feelings, like love and joy, uh, you know, or even anger. Uh, all your expressions that we have, those are also geometrical. It was Manfred Klein who was the first person on Earth to, to scientifically determine this and was written up in uh, different magazines and journals because of this, because the world didn't know that before that. But even those kinds of things are geometrical. And all of it, there is, without exception, everything in the universe was created through the Merkaba 
that is around your body. But not just the one we're talking about. There are many, many other Merkabas around your body. Uh, I'll explain this very quickly. There are, that are known and are stable, and I'll explain that, there are about 100,200 uh, other kinds of Merkabas besides the one that we're using. And, uh, and these uh, other Merkabas took billions and billions and billions of years for the universe to determine, discover, unfold, and live. And, uh, and they have been mapped, and they know, and the, the universe knows and understands what they are. And uh, there are about roughly 500,000 more that are geometrically possible Merkabas, but they have problems. And some of these problems don't show up right away. There have been entire planets that have died from using a Merkaba that seemed okay, and then after maybe a thousand years, it changed in ways they didn't understand, and it killed them all. Uh, we, there have been many disasters uh, in, the, in the study of Merkaba throughout the universe. Uh, right now, we know what is stable, we know what will exast, uh, list forever, and, uh, and, uh, and the one that we're using is one of those. Uh, it's only of the 100,200, we're only on the second one, too. <laughs> There's one more before this, which is a very simple one, which has been used by uh, shamans and medicine men around the world for thousands and thousands of years. It's very simple, it's very limited. It will allow you to go into the fourth dimension, but only for a short amount of time. So it allows a, a, a medicine man to disappear right before you and then come back, which may seem like 10 minutes later, but he's been gone for a long time because of the dif differences in the time ratios between the third and the fourth dimension. But uh, this is, th this one is, it's not a, it is, the reason we don't use it in, at, at this point in time in history is because it will not allow you to live on the fourth dimension, and we need to go from the third to the fourth and stay there to begin our journey, which we're all going to make. And so uh, the Merkaba that we are teaching now is perfect for that. Uh, there is no other Merkaba in existence right now that will replace this for the purpose of what we're about to do. I don't care what anybody says out there, there isn't. Uh, there's many other shapes, there's many other ways of doing it. They may, be, may even seem like higher ones, but they're no good for this, what we're about to do. We have to be in tune with Mother Earth. We have to, she has a Merkaba around her. That Merkaba is a star tetrahedral Merkaba, and NASA has met, now been able to determine that. All the planets have star tetrahedrons, Merkabas around them, and so does the sun. And, uh, and so the idea or understanding that I'm trying to give to you is that this particular Merkaba is the appropriate one because that's the, the environment that we are in is using that. And in, or, in order for, for Mother Earth and Father Son to begin this mass ascension that's about to happen, we have to be in tune with her and we have to uh, be in the same vibration as her or we won't be able to follow her moves and, her, and, her, and let her take us into these other worlds. If you have some other Merkaba going on, you're going to be in trouble. And I suggest you rethink whatever it is that you're doing. Okay, this is kind of the basis of all of this. Um, uh, and we'll slowly go through these questions and try to see. So, his, to answer his question, yes, this is a very physical thing. It, it can be put, picked up with instruments. It can be put on com to computer screens, and you can see it. And so, it is a very real thing. It is not just some idea in spirituality. Uh, his next part of this question is interesting. He says, are you required to find a yin to your yang, as in to get a girlfriend, etc., in order to successfully ascend, or how does that work? Well, you can do this as an individual. Uh, it is possible, and probably most people will do it as an individual. But you can also do it in Tantra and in, and in combination with another person. And that way requires more knowledge, more understanding, and it may be more beautiful in a lot of ways, but those, those people are going to end up being in exactly the same place. Uh, it can also be done in groups, in much larger groups, and, and it has been done that way before. Uh, uh, that requires even more understanding and more knowledge and, and more synchronicity. 
but uh, it is possible. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, now here we go. This next one is, sounds kind of silly. It says, uh, do we become human spaceships? <laughs> because the Merkaba, when you see it, it looks like a spaceship. Well, the word Merkaba, uh, actually, uh, if you take it in uh, Hebrew, Merkaba or Merkaba is how it's said in Hebrew, uh, it, it, uh, it has two meanings. And the first meaning is that it means a, a chariot or a vehicle a vehicle that will take somebody from one place to another. It also has the meaning of the throne of God because it is the creation patterns that created everything in existence. And so it makes perfect sense on that. But the Merkaba is a vehicle. In Egypt, it's Merkaba, which is three words. And Mer is, counter, is a counter-rotating field of light. And Ka means spirit and Ba means body. At least it means body when you have a physical form. If you're beyond physical form, it means the body of your wisdom, your knowledge, your, your memories, your experience, etc. And, and so what this is, is a vehicle in, in Egypt, Egyptian that will take you from one world to another and it'll take your spirit and your body with you as one. And, uh, and in truth, it is the only way you can go from one level of existence to another. You must have your Merkaba to do it uh, consciously, uh, we there is a way in the situation that we're in now that that you can uh, escape that, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, pretty much, uh, it does become a spaceship. It will take you uh, literally not only in space where you can go from one planet to another, but it'll take you from a higher frequency. Non, and not only in the third dimension to the fourth, but as we proceed in this ascension pattern that we are about to do, uh, it will take you into all the various levels that we need to go. And there's 144 dimensions in this world, and we're only on number three right now. So we have a long ways to go. Um, okay, uh, here, this, is, this is from the Wind Mountain Goat. <laughs> uh, he says, what is the best way to picture the Merkaba around you or to activate it and to keep it active? Uh, specifically when you are in crowded places with lots of people. Thank you. And then he goes, Merkaba for the whole planet. <laughs> uh, first of all, the, the, like I said, the, the planet does have a Merkaba. And, uh, but that Merkaba, just so you know, was shut down for almost 500 years. It was closed. Uh, in Japan, it was Amaterasu, the light of the sun, in their tradition, that went into the earth about 530-something years ago. In the Mayan tradition, which has it in their calendar, exactly to the minute, the same time that the Japanese have, it shows how we went into darkness. And, uh, and we've been in that time until just recently. And uh, so, uh, the... Merkaba that is around the planet is, uh, is like I said before, it is exactly, it, planets do have Merkabas and there will come a day when we will tune to that Merkaba and become one with it. That's how we, we make the ascension. And if you're not in the right frequency, you won't be able to tune to it. Uh, okay. Uh, come down here to another one. I can't answer all the questions, by the way. I have like 400 questions or something. <laughs> we would be here for about two weeks. I don't think that can happen. Um, this one comes from Diane, and it says, is it good enough to just know it is there, meaning the Merkaba, or do we have to engage in serious meditation and hold the image? Once just simply know it, or does it stay? Well, uh, knowing that it's there is, is, for most people, the doorway that allows this to eventually happen. Um, this is a very complex question, even though it sounds simple. Uh, the way that we taught this originally, and, and this video, ta uh, this uh, audio tape that we're going to give you prior to this, uh, talks about this in detail. But uh, the knowing is the doorway. But to but to but in order to reach this. Uh, Merkaba, it usually, normally, require, requires pretty serious meditation. 
you have to line up a lot of internal technologies within the body to make this happen from a male point of view. Uh, and if you don't do it right, it won't function. And so uh, it generally in uh, Kundalini yoga, in Kriya yoga, in Tibetan, yo Tibetan uh, meditation, it takes a very, very long time to uh, activate the Merkaba through the meditation process. We have it down to about five days, uh, and, uh, and, but that won't work for everyone. It'll work for maybe a third or 40% or so of the people, and the rest of them still have to take a year or two to be able to actually get it working properly. And so uh, that's one side of it. The other side is, is that there is a female way of doing this. And that female way is nothing you can write down. In a male way, which I did, you can write it down. It's in The, the Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, uh, Volume 2. You can go into this one of my books, and you can go in there, and it'll tell you in great detail how to do this uh, from uh, a male point of view. But it is possible to do it from a female point of view also. And that is nothing you can put into a book and say, here's how you do it, because it's never the same ever twice in a row. Or it may be twice in a row, but never again. Uh, and so there are people in the world that have never been to teachers and have never, uh, don't even know what the word Merkaba means, but they just are sitting in a bathtub having a good time, and when all of a sudden they start feeling this rotation around their body and they don't know what's happening, and bam, this thing comes out, it will sometimes happen automatically without any kind of uh, stimulation whatsoever. That usually happens, though, with people that have had m many years of meditation around this in past lives. It usually isn't something that just happens, but it can happen, and, uh, and, it is, and all things are possible. Um, okay, I, I think that will explain a little bit, and we'll keep going, and hopefully this will keep unfolding deeper. Uh, this is from Melissa. She says, I have visions of the Merkaba often. Does that mean my own is awakening to me further, or that I'm integrating with it at deeper levels? Uh, that's very often how it happens, is you begin to see yourself in a dream, and you're surrounded by a counter-rotating field of light. Uh, and uh, And... It's the beginning of your awakening and your remembering who you really are. Who you really are is far more than what you th probably think you are. Uh, we generally think of us as a human being that only has a limited l lifetime on this earth. But we have always been alive and we always will be alive. We are actually already immortal whether we know it or not. But relative to the larger system at the moment, uh, we are in a kind of a stalemate with life. Uh, we have fallen. We have uh, lost a great deal of our understanding and remembrance. That's all going to come back to you, everything. You're not going to lose anything. You're going to remember all your memories. You're going to know who you are, and, and your stability in the universe is going to come back again with every single person on Earth right now. It's just a matter of time. And uh, so don't worry. Don't go into fear. There's no reason for fear. Fear actually slows this process down. Uh, the more daring you are and willing to go out into life, uh, the better chance you have. And the next one is from uh, Patricia. Uh, can the Merkaba be practiced to save the natural environment? Yes, it can. And it not only can, but there are hundreds of people that are doing this right now. Because it, the Merkaba is a natural phenomena, and it duplicates exactly what the Earth is, has, was created through, uh, it is possible when you are working with, the, with Mother Earth, you have to have permission, real serious permission from Mother Earth to begin to do this. But if you get that permission, uh, you can use a Merkaba, which is called a surrogate or an external Merkaba. We have a Merkaba around it, but you can duplicate that around, a, say, a piece of land or a larger area. And, uh, and you can uh, uh, remotely control that and program it in certain ways so that it will begin to clear the environment. We have done this scientifically. We have had uh, 
Mexico and other countries measure what we were doing and be able to see it happen, and it's real. And, uh, and so, uh, but if you do choose to do this, it's not easy. I once gave a, gave a workshop on this, on exactly how to do it, for about five workshops to about 100 people each. And I found out that after 500 people, I was only to get got three people that were able to do it. Uh, so it's not impossible, but it's difficult to be able to come to the place where you can realize that you can actually change things. You can change the 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 oceans, the the soil. You can you can actually recreate uh, the earth when you fully remember this. And I hope that you do. Uh, you'll know exactly what to do. But you must do this in with Mother Earth's permission, because without it, she won't let you do it. Uh, this is a huge subject, as you might imagine. Okay, uh, this is from Andrew, and he says, How does the Merkaba stabilize? Uh, in theory, does not the Merkaba always, always stable? Is it contingent on the stability of the vibration and consciousness of the user, or is that simply a matter of perception with regard to the interaction between the user and the Merkaba? Uh, those, the, you must have to understand, the, the Merkaba is not an object. Even though it is, it is an electromagnetic field, it is a living field, it is alive, it's conscious, and it is your consciousness that is in that Merkaba. And so, uh, it is, it, it, you have to understand that before I can even a- answer the question. And so, in order to stabilize the Merkaba, it is your consciousness and your awareness that, cr- that brings the stability to the Merkaba. Uh, we used to teach the Merkaba where you activated it through mudras and in a very specific way. This was through the Flower of Life. And we did that for many, many years. Now we have changed everything. Uh, we, are, we have been, by the Ascended Masters, have asked us to go back and, and to begin to do this in the way that it was done uh, a long, long, long time ago. And which is not starting with the Merkaba, it's starting with the heart. And from the heart, we reconnect back through the tongue to the brain, and we establish a connection through the third eye. And then from there, these beams of light come out, and a sphere appears around you. A halo appears that science has now documented. And once you're in that state, the Merkaba happens automatically. You don't have to do anything. You just breathe in a certain way, and the Merkaba comes out. But it is, it is a fully mature, stabilized Merkaba instantaneously. If you're doing it in the old way, where you're creating it through, through your own energies, uh, that way you, the stability happens through the speed ratios that are used. Uh, uh, you begin with a speed ratio of one-third the speed of light. You then jump it up to two-thirds the speed of light, which even at two-thirds, that's like, I don't know, 140,000 miles a second of this thing is spinning around you. And it's still... Uh, not stable. It actually begins to wobble. And then you have to jump it up to nine-tenths the speed of light. A lot of people don't understand why we chose nine-tenths the speed of light. And it wasn't just a choice. Uh, It was based on the reality again. Every single electron that's rotating around every single atom in the entire makeup of the universe that we're in is rotating at nine-tenths the speed of light. It's not 9.1-tenths the speed of light. It's exactly nine-tenths, and that's because it's a whole number fraction, and that's the only thing that life knows how to work with. And so uh, uh, we use nine-tenths for the purpose of learning how to use it, not going beyond the speed of light, because that throws you into another dimensional world. And if you end up in that dimensional world without really understanding the Merkaba, that's a problem, because you don't know what you're doing, and you're, you're not going to be able to be stay, you won't be able to stay there. And so you have to, uh, we put it at nine-tenths the speed of light so that you could be in this world, in third-dimensional world, and practice it and learn it and use it and understand how it works and make surrogate or external Merkabas and understand how they work. Begin to program your Merkaba and see how that works so you can learn it and remember what it is. And then later, on what we call the 18th breath, that's when you leave. And... uh, that has never been taught by me, by the way, ever before. 
and uh, even though there are people that say they're teaching this. But uh, when you actually take the 18th breath, you're gone. Your body is no longer on earth. <laughs> so people who are giving 18th breath workshops and then everybody walks out of it probably didn't get it because you would not be in your body and you'd be somewhere else. Uh, however, uh, I have been given the instructions to teach the 18th breath very soon. Uh, it's pretty exciting, but you have to know a lot to do that. And so uh, it isn't something you can just do or imagine. Okay, we'll go to another one here. This is Morris, and he's asking, can the Merkabe be used for time travel? Uh, yeah, it can. Uh, when you enter into the Merkaba and you enter into the fourth dimension, you don't see the way you're seeing now with two eyes looking out like this. You see spherically in all directions at once, simultaneously. That's almost hard to imagine, but that's how you see in the fourth dimension. And, and in the same way, when you look at time, all things in this third dimension that we are in are polarized. And the polarization is between two poles and with a middle in the middle. So you have hot water and you have cold water and you have warm water. But you also have a male and female and child. You have earth and sun and you have the moon. And you can keep going on this and there's billions of these polarities that are in all, every kinds of way. And, uh, and when you look at uh, space, you have the X, Y, Z axis of how we see space. When you look at time, you have the past, the present, and the future. But that only works in a polarity consciousness. As soon as you enter into uh, this particular polarity consciousness, as soon as you enter into the fourth dimension, which is still a form of polarity consciousness, uh, time changes completely. And you can experience any level of time in the past, the present, or future as you wish, uh, as you eventually see. You can be anywhere in space, time, or dimension, or size. Size is actually more important than time, than space, or than dimension. Size is more crucial in the equation, which we don't even think about it most of the time. Um, okay, so uh, it, the, the, the stability of this is done by your mind connecting to the Merkaba and causing it to move at nine-tenths the speed of light, and at that particular speed, this, the Merkaba goes like a rock, it becomes stable. And that's why we do it, one of the reasons. <clears throat> uh, okay, this one is from Chris, and he asks about humic and fulvic acid and how, and how does this help in the process, or do they? Humic and fulvic acid is pretty interesting because, uh, and I really suggest you guys educate yourself about it because it is probably one of the most important uh, substances on Earth. It is the all life on Earth that lived on the surface as you know, all that DNA eventually goes down and becomes oil. But when it gets at about two or three meters below the surface, it's sometimes captured in various ways. And, uh, and w one of the ways is through Leonite shale. It captures it in little, little uh, airtight bubbles and holds it for 100 to 300 million years. And, uh, and that substance, that is the DNA of all life from 100 to 300 million years ago, when that DNA goes into your body, it causes your immune system to go off the scale and you get extremely healthy. But it's more than that, especially the fulvic acid. Uh, the um, History Channel did a, uh, a, uh, a one hour long program on uh, uh, spaceships, ET spaceships, uh, um, about two or three years ago. And in there, they took uh, spaceships that had landed on Earth that had been recorded by different ways that they felt were more legitimate. In their case, it was police departments, military, firemen, and these kinds of things that were there and were able to determine it and, and that it was real. And, uh, and so they had many of these. And the History Channel went out to these places and the films that they saw, and they found that in this, where the ship had actually landed, when they took off, there was always this little pile of white powder. And they didn't tell you through the show what it was. And then they kept going on to this, and they, said, and they kept talking about this white powder, and that's how they kept saying what it was. And then they went into where the, they found that, uh, that, that they could take ordinary boxes of steel, just like a box, put a person in it, 
rub this white powder on it, and the thing would lift off the ground and float around. And, uh, and they're still trying to understand what that is. But the long and the short of all this, at the very end, they tell you what it is. It's fulvic acid. And so fulvic acid plays an important role in space travel, also using metal boxes or ships. And so uh, what it means on those levels, I don't know yet. But uh, I've been studying fulvic and humic acid for fifth, about, no, about 12 years. And uh, I'm discovering it is a really important substance. And what it does for you on uh, another level is that it purifies your body of all the toxins and mercury and lead and everything in your body. It is the best uh, um, chelation system known on Earth. And in three to four months, it makes you squeaky clean. That alone helps you in your meditation because it makes you clear, cleaner, and healthier. And those, those things are important when you're trying to reach into other levels of existence. This one says, uh, D uh, Diego uh, wants to know how many breaths the Merkaba meditation takes to complete. Ever since I introduced this to the world, uh, people have changed it in a million different ways. They've changed the speed ratios. They've changed all kinds of things. They've added this. They've taken stuff away. But from, from the Ascended Masters, where I got this information, uh, it takes 17 breaths exactly to create the Merkaba uh, synthetically. And it takes the 18th breath to actually make it move from the third to the fourth or higher dimensional levels. Um, you don't need any more than that. And uh, there are other ways of looking at this, uh, but I don't think that w I think it would cause more confusion than anything right now. Okay, let me go down to the next one. Um, this is from Mark, and he says, I hear a lot of people talking about certain stones like Andaris and instantly activating people's Merkaba, or even people who can activate Merkabas for others during sessions. This all sounds gimmicky, gimmicky, gimmicky <laughs> to me, and I believe activating your Merkaba is much more involved and comes with great responsibility. Not sure what you think. Well, um, there are certain crystals and stones that will assist you in uh, activating your Merkaba, but uh, I am not aware of any stones that will activate your Merkaba on their own. Uh, it may be true, but I'm not aware of them. And, uh, and if that was the case, it would sure make it easy for us on the, on the earth if that was true. Uh, he also talks about people uh, activating Merkaba for other people. That is absolutely illegal throughout the entire universe. It's against the law. And, uh, and it produces an unbelievable karma. You affect the person's evolution when you activate their Merkaba, and you change them forever, and you change their evolutionary path forever, and not necessarily in a positive way. That's, uh, that would take a long time to explain that, but uh, you can't activate someone else's Merkaba. You just are not allowed to do that. No more than you can go to a planet uh, from space and begin to mess around with them and change their evolutions. It's illegal. Uh, everyone is supposed to arrive and move through their states of evolution on their own without uh, any external uh, uh, interference would probably be the better word. And so um, you can't do that. Now, after saying that, <laughs> uh, there, is a, there is one exception, and that is if you're a mother or a father and you have children, and you're in a situation that is a life and death situation, and at no other time is this allowed, uh, you can activate their Merkabas uh, temporarily for the purpose of getting them through the situation that's happening at that moment. Uh, but even if you had three of your children and one of somebody else's, you weren't allowed to activate that other child's Merkaba, only your own. Those are the laws. I didn't make them up, and so, uh, and all I can do is tell you what they are. It's now up to you to follow your integrity. Uh, here's another question that Mark says. I try to allow people to think as they will, 
I've just been working with Merkaba for a while and feel like it shouldn't be a product of the New Age money-making machine version of spirituality. Uh, would I cover this? Um, I agree with that on, on a lot of levels, but let's just discuss that for a moment. Uh, spirituality in the United States and Canada and throughout Europe and Mary, it's mostly Christianity is, where, is what it's based upon. Uh, the Christian religion believes that spirituality should never be charged for. It should be free. And, uh, and that is what Christianity believes and that's where these kinds of ideas are coming from. I was also Sufi for 11 years and was deeply involved in, um, in Muslim traditions and ideas. And in their, that aspect of things, they believe the exact opposite, that you are never, ever to give spirituality away for free under any conditions. And, and, uh, and the reason is because they say there must be an exchange of energy. It doesn't have to be money, but it has to be an exchange of energy. And, and the reason they, they say that is because they find that if someone is given spirituality for free, they don't listen, they don't think about it, it's not important to them, and it's basically throwing pearls before swine. And so I, uh, I tried both ways for a long time. I tried doing it for free, and I tried doing it with an exchange. And I found that I believe the Muslims are right. If you, whenever I give away a workshop for free, or if some, even if somebody else pays for the workshop, or if uh, uh, even however it happens, if they get in there for, without any exchange, these are the people that come in late. These are the people that are on their cell phones talking. These are the people that leave early. And these are the people that don't understand what happened they did because they weren't conscious through the whole thing. And, and when I really understood that, I, I gave up and started charging. But there's another thing that, that, that the Sufis say, and that is that when you charge, it has to be fair. Now, there are people here that came into Sedona that were charging $10,000 for a five-day workshop. Is that fair? No, but people paid it. And, uh, and so it has to be a small amount that people can afford, and there has to be an exchange. And, uh, and there, are, uh, uh, there are other reasons uh, why, but uh, that's the primary reasons. And so what I do is that when I, somebody wants to come to one of my workshops, I have a price, and, um, and I hope that it is fair. Uh, we charge usually between 555 and 777, depending on how long the workshops are. And, uh, and uh, if a person is not working and they can't make that, they can't afford to do that, then I say, fine, it's okay with me. Just go, we give them so many hours, uh, we give them, I think, $20 an hour, and we divide that into how, how much the workshop costs. And so let's just say it's 30 hours. And we tell them, go to the Red Cross or to some form of where you can volunteer, since you're not working, you have no money, and just go and volunteer for 30 hours or whatever the number is, and just and bring us back a letter signed by them saying that you've volunteered. And that's just as good as money. People that do are willing to do that, when they come in there, they're sitting in the front row, and they really listen, and they really practice, and they, and they study. And so this is my opinion on that. Uh, okay, the next one. This is from Melly, And uh, it says, if we just know about the Merkaba and do yogic practices and make a conscious choice to be loving in our hearts, is that enough? Uh, it's enough for a lot of levels, but probably your Merkaba is not going to activate unless it activates through a female pattern within yourself. If it's a male pattern that you're trying to activate it with, just knowing of it and being a really good person, uh, I wish it was so, but it usually does not work. And that's kind of it in a short answer. Uh, this is from Melanie. Is the Merkaba the same thing as our astral light body? And are we using our Merkaba to travel in the dream time? Uh, the Merkaba is, it, it is not exactly the same thing as your astral body, but it is your light body. It, electromagnetic field is light, 
and it is a light body. Uh, when you activate your Merkaba, you can see it. If you have the instruments, you can pick it up. You're picking up the light, and you're picking up the entire full spectrum of it. You can put it on a screen, and you can see it. And so it, it is the light body that comes from the physical body. And uh, can you use it to travel in the dream time? Uh, we have two dream times. We have the brain that dreams, and it dreams in polarity, so that you have good dreams and bad dreams, or good dreams and nightmares. And, uh, and in that dream time, uh, the Merkaba is not necessary to have. Uh, it isn't, you don't need it. In the heart body, also has a dream time associated with it that is entirely different than the dream time of your brain. It's, this one is connected to your higher heart chakra. The lower one is connected to the lower heart chakra. And, uh, and the lower heart chakra, its dream time is not just a dream. It is, it is the creator of reality. And the Merkaba is needed in that dream time in order to travel within it. And so uh, one question is, yes, you do in the heart. No, you don't in the, heart, in the brain. Uh, this is from Serena. She says, I have a question about the Merkaba. I was told that we have a six-pointed triangle, a triangle inside of an upside-down triangle, about six inches above our heads, and that we can use it to spin Christ consciousness, to clear our energy field. If this is so, it, is this our personal Merkava? Well, you've struck upon it, it but it's three-dimensional. It's not a triangle. It's, they're called tetrahedrons. And again, if you really want to understand this in detail, read the ancient secret of the flower of life, because we detail this in great detail there and explain it all, and you'll be able to understand. But uh, uh, And it, it isn't just six inches. It's exactly one hand length above your head is where the tip of that Merkaba goes, and it's one hand length below your feet is where the other one ends below that. And uh, it's very, very specific. The body is not just a, a random thing. It is extremely specific in, in its ratios and proportions. Um, okay, uh, let's see. This is from Darren. He says, how do we activate the Merkama? Well, I guess we already talked about that in a way. Uh, will we potentially lose our memories if we do not have it activated? Will it matter either way? If we are in love, do you, do you feel having your memories erased would not matter because we are just in the moment. Well, this is kind of a different question that's involved here. Uh, we talked about the activation of the Merkaba, but uh, the potentially of losing your memory, what that's associated with is the solar flares and the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, I, th I believe we are going to make a very detailed uh, uh, tape on all of this about the the magnetic fields of the earth and etc but uh, what happened in Atlantis in our last time and was and we're still suffering from right now is that uh, when the earth shifted its axis it, it, the poles the magnetic poles went to zero and when they went to zero after two weeks our Magnetic memory, which we our memory is held by magnetics. Science understands this now. We have discovered that there are magnetic uh, shields around in our uh, the membranes of our of our cells of our brain, and in other areas of within our body, and uh, and we contain our memories through magnetics, and we can and if the magnetic field of the earth, which sustains those memories. What was is the power and the energy that sustains them. If it goes to zero after about two to two and a half weeks, uh, our memories are erased completely. And that's what happened to millions of people on the earth before. And we end up becoming hairy barbarians and starting all over. We had a very high technology then. But right now, if, you're, if everybody's memory was erased, you wouldn't even know how to get out of the room you're in. You wouldn't know what a doorknob was. You wouldn't know anything. And you'd be right back to learning how to start fires again. Uh, that happened before. It could happen this time, too. And there are many countries right now that are deeply concerned about this and trying to prepare for the eventuality of that, of that, that which may happen. 
Uh, we don't know if it's going to happen yet, but there is a very high potential that it could happen. If you have a Merkaba rotating around you, uh, it will maintain the Earth's magnetic field even though there isn't one. It will keep it within you and you won't even know there is any difference and you will continue, all your memory and understanding and knowledge will continue perfectly uh, even through a catastrophe of that nature. And uh, now when the Russians, the first cosmonauts went into space on the Mir space station, the first one that ever went up there, after about two weeks he was up there and he lost all of his memories and he went insane. That's another side effect. And, uh, and they had to go up and get him. They put another person in there and brought him down. And, and then the second one also went insane. And that's when they realized it wasn't just him. This was a phenomenon associated with deep space. And so they, through their studies, uh, they realized that it was the magnetic field of the Earth that was causing the problem. And they created a little instrument that went on, on the side of the, of the, uh, the spacesuit so that it would approximate the Earth's magnetic field. And they discovered that by doing that, uh, the, uh, the uh, person did not go lose their memories and did not go insane. Uh, Russia has now declared that not only are their memories permanent, the loss is permanent, but the insanity is also permanent. They have no way to fix it. They don't know how. And so, uh, all of this, you know, if you could, sure, you can create a little instrument, but that's only as good as long as you've got your batteries are working. <laughs> if the batteries go out, then you won't even remember what a battery is, so it won't matter, I guess. But uh, if you do it through the Merkava field, which is the way to do it, uh, you're fine. you'll be fine through all of this. And so uh, right now there are millions of people that are in their Merkavas. And so through the survival efforts of what's about to happen, there will be at least millions of people that will be able to make this through, make it through this. We got pages of these things. This one says, "Do we really have to leave this planet?" This is from Denny. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we do. Whether we like it or not, I, uh, we do. But it's not a bad thing. What's about to happen when you get into the sequence of this event of what's going on, uh, you're going to be really glad. You're going to be happy because you're going to realize the darkness that you were in now, the density. You're going to, re in the remembering of who you really are, you're going to remember how to create everything. And you're going to remember that you don't need anything. You're a whole, complete, and perfect, lacking nothing. And, uh, and that... And you're also going to remember your connection between you and God, your intimate connection. And not only God, but all life everywhere. Every single living thing in existence, not just here on earth, but everywhere, is all interconnected through a single spirit. And, uh, and you will remember that and be part of it. Uh, this is a great gift that is about to happen. This is a healing back to uh, who we once were. There is nothing to fear in this. There's no reason for fear. There's no reason for conspiracy theories or anything else if you really understood what's happening. Sure, there's a lot of conspiracy theories going on in the world, and some of them are real. But this is beyond all that. There is no secret government that can stop what is about to happen. Uh, you are going to become you, who you really are, again. This is a blessing. Please, don't be concerned. Also, uh, in, when we do leave this planet at the final, we're going to go through many, many, many stages of this, and so is the whole universe moving through all these different stages. Eventually, we're going to get to the 144th dimensional level. And once we get there, we're going to pass over to, we could call it the 145th, but it's really the, it's, it's like exactly like music. The whole universe is like music. And, it's like, and so th this is based on a chromatic scale of 12 notes, and we're on the third note. And, uh, and in between each one of these is 12 overtones. And so it produces 12 primary universes and uh, 144 minus 12, 132 uh, minor universes. And, uh, and that's just the way it is. And we're going to experience all of these very rapidly, not over billions of years, but in a very, very short period of time. So in the leaving of this planet, we're not only going to move through all these changes, but 
because of the nature of music, we're moving from one, what are called octave of universes, which is a chromatic scale, really, to another chromatic scale of universes. We're going, it's the same thing repeating itself, only different. <laughs> it, it's just not exactly the same, but almost the same in the way the laws work through all these different levels. <clears throat> And the whole universe is moving from there to here. It's not just us. It's not just humans or this planet. It's everybody. And as we do, we are going to be one living person as we make this transition from this world to the other. When we get to that other world, this universe will no longer exist. I know that's a hard one. <laughs> it's hard to understand. But uh, it will not exist because, and this is going to even be harder to explain, but it's just straightforward fact and truth. The outer universe never did exist. It never was. It is, the best way to think of it is like a hologram. And that we're in, like in, in Star Trek, like a, 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 the, the, the holodeck. Uh, we are in, but it's not created by computers or anything else like that. It's cr created through our consciousness, our human consciousness. And we created everything. We created every planet, every star, every person, every rock, every single thing in the universe. And it's only consciousness. That's all it is. It's not made up of anything else. It's only consciousness. And, and because of that, we are going to revert back into pure consciousness, go into another way of doing it, and start all over again. And, uh, and this is God doing this. This is the one source of life, of everything. And, uh, and if you have a complaint about this, you need to talk to God, because there's <laughs> nothing I can do about it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, this is, uh, I don't know, T-E-R-E -E Terre, I guess, I'm not sure. She says, uh, how do you know your Merkaba is active? Is the tube that you can see coming out from your third eye an indication that it is open? I think that's two questions. Uh, how do you know the Merkaba is active? That is difficult unless you have the computer mechanisms like, like Russia has to be able to see the Merkaba and put it up on the screen. And I believe NASA has this now also. But they've never allowed this out into, uh, into the public. But without that, there are some people that can see the Merkaba. For me, if I want to see the Merkaba, I have to sit down in meditation and I have to get really, really still. I got to go in for about at least 20 minutes to 30 minutes and I can get into this really still place. And then from there I can open my eyes and I can see the Merkaba. But in my normal everyday life, like I am right now, I can't see the Merkaba. But there are, uh, you can use dowsing rods and you can use the dowsing rods and, and right when you come up to it, you'll be about 25, 30 feet away from the person which is the outer edge of their field, and you'll feel it open up. And, uh, and that's when you can tell. You can use that to do it. You can use pendulums. And you can use other uh, intuitive ways of, of knowing that it's there besides seeing. Uh, so you would have to find someone that can do that. If you, if you want me to do it, it takes a long time <laughs> for me to, to know it. It's beautiful when you see them. Uh, they're amazing. They're at the colors and the, and the changing of the colors and, and what's going on in them. And they're, they're so psychedelic. And they're so beautiful. Uh, it's inspiring to see them. It, it changes your whole belief in the reality the first time you ever see the Merkaba. Okay, I'm going to drop down to Christiana. She says, would you say it is the only way for a specific result or are there many ways to do the same, same thing? There are slightly different ways of doing the Merkaba that have been discovered around the universe, <laughs> not just here. And uh, in the Merkaba, you have 17 breaths. The first six breaths are balancing your energies and purifying your chakra system and everything before you start out. There are lots of ways of doing that. You can actually take that system, throw it away, and put other ones in. We chose that one because it is used more than any other system in the universe because it's very, act, it's very simple and it works perfect. And that's why we just used it. That's why the, the Senda Masters used it. Uh, to change the nature of how to activate a synthetic Merkaba, which is what most people in the world is doing right now, <clears throat> that is dangerous. 
that is extremely, extremely dangerous to do that. Uh, I would basically just simply say, no, don't do it. Uh, the tube that she is talking about coming from the third eye, you actually have, in order to activate the, the third eye, there are eight beams of light that have to come out of your pineal gland. They're visible. You can see them with just a little bit of training. If you can see auras, or if you could see the prana fields around people, uh, or, and if you know dowsing, uh, it's very easy to teach those kinds of people how to see uh, the beams of light. It doesn't take very much. Uh, you have to know something exists before you can see it. It's a funny thing. Uh, you really do. Magellan, when he in his ships, proved that uh, a long time ago. So the, this this sphere around you have a glowing sphere when your your heart is connected to your brain, and there's these tubes that come out that we were just talking about. One of those tubes comes directly out of your third eye, which if you take the tip of your your thumb and the and your longest finger, and you put it on your chin and your nose, and then go up like this, and rock it over. That's where your third eye opening is. I don't care what you think it is somewhere else, that's where it is. We can scientifically show that. And this is the place. And, uh, and you're actually, when you open your eye, there's a, a tube of light, and you're looking out through a tube of light. You're looking from within it out. And so some people can see that tube, and some people can't see that tube. It's just a phenomena, and it's just uh, part of meditation. It's okay. Uh, this one is from Maria, and she says, uh, how, how do you keep the Merkaba in good shape? That might seem funny. It might seem, uh, if the Merkaba was created synthetically, that's one thing. If it was created naturally, which is uh, what we're now teaching how to do it, uh, it's different. If it's a synthetic Merkaba, and uh, if you don't give it attention every single day, after 47 hours, it will die. It will just, it's, it's just like a, a living thing, and it needs to be watered every day. But you know what it's like? It's exactly like a little tiny tree. You plant a little tree in the ground, and you give it water. And you keep watering it every day, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. After about two years, uh, the, the tree is up higher, it's, it's stronger, its roots has reached down in there, and now it's connected into the earth in such a way that it can get its own water, and you can stop watering it because it'll keep growing. And the Merkaba is very similar to that. You keep giving it prana every day and keep loving it, and it gets bigger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and after about two years it becomes permanent, and you don't have to do that anymore. But still, if you forget it, and if you just don't think about it anymore, another phenomena happens. Uh, your Merkaba wants love. It wants to feel attention and love because it's part of you. It's like if you have your body and you never wash it or comb your hair or ever think about it ever again. It's, you're not loving your body. And the same way your Merkaba wants love also. What happens if you don't do anything? The breathing tube, which if you put your thumb and your middle finger together, your breathing tube is that big around. If it was just around something that would just give it a little tiny bit of pressure, and so it's different. It depends on your hand size, how big your, your tube is. And if you don't give your, uh, your Merkaba any attention after those two years, that breathing tube will expand and it'll sometimes get about this big. It'll get huge. And uh, it weakens it. It doesn't die. It will keep living, but it weakens its strength. And uh, you can fix it very quickly. You just, I just kind of pat your little Merkaba and say, oh, I love you, and give it love, and breathe in it, and whoosh, that tube will go tight again real fast. But you have to give it attention. If your Merkaba was created naturally, and which makes it become permanent instantaneously, it's, a, it's in the same place as a two-year-old synthetic one, um, it, will, it still needs love. But so far, we haven't seen the expansion of the breathing tube. And so I don't know yet exactly what that means, except that it seems to be a lot stronger than a synthetic one in the way that it's created. Uh, give me another year or so, and I'll be able to answer that a little bit better. This is from TJASA. Tajsa? I'm not sure how that's said. I'm sorry. 
when your Merkaba is activated, do you always necessarily have to feel or visualize it precisely during the meditation, or is it enough to just sense the swirling outside of the tetrahedrons? That's a really good question. Um, there's different ways of seeing and sensing and feeling. There is, there is a male way and there's a female way, and they're really different. Uh, the male way, uh, you, you put those on a spectrum. Here, you've got a long line here. The male way is over here, and the female way is over here. The, the male way is uh, uh, very precise. Males are focused on seeing. They see. And so if you ask a male, a pure male, which there is no such thing, and there is no pure female, we're, we're a mixture of both. And uh, But if you, if you have a, a male that's very, very, very male and very pure, uh, and you ask him to see something like an apple, uh, he will see that apple. I mean, he could see that apple like a photograph, and he can rotate it around and look at it, and he'll know, you know a lot about that apple, but he'll gain his knowledge primarily from seeing. If you ask a female to see the same apple, she will see nothing. There'll just be darkness there and no visual thing in front of her at all. Females are focused more on sound rather than light. And hearing is more important to them to what the, than what, what they see. And so uh, they, they get the vibration from it, the, the, the frequency. And they're better at getting information than men are from picking up. And so they can... They don't see anything. There's nothing there. But they can tell you everything about that apple. They can tell you what color it is, what state it came from, who picked it. Uh, they can go on and on. They can tell you what it tastes like, how much it weighs. They can tell you anything about that apple. But they're not actually seeing anything. What I'm relating this to is there are four basic ways of seeing. There's male, there's female, there's both at once, and there's a fourth way, which is neutral. It's, uh, there are very, very few of those people in the world. The male way is what we just said. The female is just what we just said. But what most people do is the way we haven't said, which is both male and female simultaneously. Uh, most people are a little bit of each, so they'll kind of see the apple, and they'll use female way of sensing and feeling to get information from it, and they extract in whatever way they can in that way. Uh, and then there's that fourth way, which doesn't see, doesn't sense, doesn't do anything. They just know. And so when you tell them to see about the apple, they can just tell you anything about that apple. And yet they don't see, sense, or feel anything. They just know. There are very few of those people on Earth. But there are other places in, in the universe where the whole planets are made up of people like that. Arcturus is one of those. They're, they're extraordinary in, in their sense of development. And, uh, and so, oh, well, to, to be very specific with that question, in the Merkaba, you can sense it rotating around you. You can see it ro rotating around you. It's good if you can. It helps. It, it gives you more confidence in it. But even if you don't experience anything going around you at all, you, you're doing all the procedures or you're doing, you're doing everything right, but you can't sense anything, that doesn't mean a thing. It, it, it's still there. If you went through the steps, it's there. And, uh, and, and it's there just as strong as someone who can see it. It just, uh, it just has to do with the way we sense and feel and, and, and bring information to ourselves. So uh, don't give up if you can't s see anything or feel anything or, or experience anything. It's still there. Okay, this next question comes from Mo Boy. It comes from B-O-S-T-J-A-N, Bastian. And uh, he says, <clears throat> what is the connection between Merkaba and planetary design of this solar system? How is the Merkaba tied to planets and how is it utilized? How is it utilizing it when activating, activation time takes process? Um, there's a huge connection. Uh, everything in existence has a Merkava around it. Uh, every single planet has its own Merkava. Every single moon has its Merkava. Every single sun and star in the universe, every big things, every single galaxy has a Merkava around it. Little things, every little atom has a Merkava around it. Every little rock 
sitting around has its own Merkaba. It's all, it's the nature of the reality. That is the projector system that created it. And that's why there's Merkabas everywhere on every size, no matter how small you go, no matter how you big. So if you went to the biggest thing possible, you would just become one big Merkaba. If you know that, it'll save you a lot of time when you're trying to f figure out physics and what, where this is all going. Uh, <clears throat> in one of the books, I think it was the first one, but it might have been the second one. Um, uh, in there, we show uh, sacred geometry, and we show a square around your body. There is a perfect square from the top of your head to your feet to out your hands. It's, it's a near-perfect square. And so that the height of the body and the width of your hands is identical, it, almost. It's within one ten thousandth of an inch difference between your height and your wing and your arm span. Now, that's if you average 100 people or more. Because our base, our, it is the Fibonacci sequence, which is approximating the golden mean, uh, is the reason why there are differences between us, if you want to study that. But the, uh, uh, this square that's around our body, there is a circle that will go around that body that will form a golden mean ratio, meaning that the perimeter of the square and the circumference of the circle are equal. And when they do, that puts it into the golden mean ratio. And when you do, between that circle going around and the square going around, there's another little circle. And so there's a circle in there, and there's a circle that will fit around that. It's pretty interesting, because the exact size of the Earth is the size of one of those bigger circles, and the size of the smaller circle is the exact size of the moon. It seems like a coincidence, but a pretty outrageous coincidence. But there were people that have thought about this since I wrote that book. And there was a man in England, I believe it was, who wrote a book. He took it off the market. I don't know if it's back on there anymore. But it's one of the more extraordinary books that anybody's ever written. He says, well, if this is true, let's see if it's really true. <clears throat> and he took all that he knew about golden, about uh, sacred geometry, and he put it into a computer. Then he took everything that NASA had discovered about the exact size of planets and the exact size of the sun and the, uh, the orbits, like the, or the Earth as it moves around the sun. He took the maximum orbit, the minimum orbit, and the mean orbit, the average, and those three things. And he plugged all those ratios and everything into all the entire solar system. And lo and behold, the entire solar system is based on perfect sacred geometry. And all of the size of every planet and every, even every little rock floating through space is within your, within your, around your body in the form of an electromagnetic field. It's already determined. And so, yes, the Merkaba plays a role in the entire universe. It's what created the universe. It is the doorway in. That's how we got into this holodeck to be able to experience it. And it is the doorway out. That's why you have to know the Merkaba. To get out of here, you must eventually know the Merkaba. If you don't learn it here in the third dimension, you've got to pick it up on the fourth dimension. And you will. You'll know exactly what to do at the right time. Uh, we are far more than we know. We're not just human beings. We are incredible. We just haven't, we just don't realize it right now. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to another one. Ah, this is so much fun. <laughs> uh, this is from Nadia, and it says, How do you know when you are ready for the 18th breath? <laughs> well, if you see a wave coming at you that's a thousand feet high, you'll be ready. <laughs> uh, there, when it's time to use that, there's going to be sensations and feelings moving through your body that you know what they are, but you haven't felt them in a very long time. And when the time comes, you, if you are prepared, uh, you will know exactly what to do. And I'm going to help you, too, because I'm going to put out ex the remembrance of exactly what to do uh, very soon. And, uh, but in order to do that, you have to know a lot. Of, it isn't just the Merkaba. Please realize the Merkaba is nothing by itself. The Merkaba has to be connected to the heart. If it's not connected to the heart, and that's through a whole inner technology that has been known on Earth for thousands and thousands of years, 
uh, but when the, when it, but it, when it is connected to the heart, then it's it it then a new kind of awareness comes into you. Actually, a sixth sense appears before you, a new way of seeing that you have never didn't even know existed, but you remember once it happens, and that uh, is the is the key to know when it is time uh, to use that 18th breath. When it does happen, you will go into a ball of light, literally, and you'll go poof and disappear with your body. You will not exist on Earth anymore. Not on this level of Earth. You will, you will go in the fourth dimension of Earth. This is from uh, Miranda, and she says, I have seen a large golden orb visit me after a friend's memorial. Are orbs also Merkabas? How does chakra meditation in alignment with bod bodily and planetary en energies relate to Mercados? I think I talked about that second half, but the first, the first half of this, of the, about the, the, the orbs, is pretty interesting, and, and, and I might as well explain that so you are clear. Uh, <clears throat> you know when you take a photograph using a digital camera, it doesn't work with an analog camera, but with a digital camera, a lot of times you take photographs and you see these orbs that are in the background. Those are Merkabas, and they are living people. Uh, they may be people that are alive now and are in meditation. They may be people that are, have passed on and have, not, and have decided not to go on to the fourth dimension, which is a possibility. And, uh, and, but what happens in a Merkaba, and this is taught even through the Native Americans, is that when you actually travel, when you take your body and you move through your Merkaba, you may think you're just imagining this. It's not imagination. It's absolutely real. But your Merkaba, the sphere of your Merkaba is way out here. If you look at Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of, a, of this, there, this, I would just be touching this outer sphere. That outer sphere, when you move, shrinks down to a sphere of somewhere between this big and this big. And your body shrinks down to a little tiny body. And you're inside this bright light. If you could get right up to one of these little orbs and look right in there with an eye, you would see the life form that is associated with that Merkaba inside there. And, and they would be little. But that's only when they switch into movement. When they go back to their actual form, they will come down, it expands out, and they become, if it's a human being, then you'll see them as a human being again. Uh, when, whenever we do ceremony and, and we're doing something sacred and, and honoring the earth and life, uh, whenever the people take photographs, we're usually just surrounded by massive amounts of these, of these spheres and these little orbs. Uh, because people that are on those levels are very sensitive to integrity and to the nature of reality. <clears throat> and whenever people are doing ceremony that is honestly uh, connecting to Mother Earth, they want to be there too. And so uh, in this case, she was at a memorial of someone who died, and there's a very good chance that the, that the orb that visited her was the person that died. So... Uh, uh, I, again, each one of these subjects could go on for long periods of time because there's, there's so much more behind them. But uh, right now we're, we're just giving a, a, a light touch on everything. This is from uh, Lily Morgan Anderson. And she says, uh, I am one of your ATIH, that's uh, teachers, that's uh, uh, Awakening the Illuminated Heart. That's the name of the new way of teaching the Merkaba that we have. And she says, she would love to hear of the differences you feel since creating your Merkaba from the tiny space of your heart last July. I feel like this is a big difference in the quality of the Merkaba from the, from the synthetic to the heart-created Merkaba. Uh, she wants to know how I feel. Well, uh, that was an interesting experience for me because... Uh, uh, I, I had been practicing the Merkaba that was done synthetically since as far back, really, as 1972. And, uh, and so I was very used to that and familiar with that. And when I was about to teach the ancient way of doing it without synthetic but through the natural way, uh, I'm in the class, I'm, I'm right up to it, and I realized moments before 
that I had not actually done that. I, I, I had only learned the final details of that shortly before that, and I hadn't actually done it. And so I did it with the class at the same time. It was so exciting. I was so excited I could hardly stand it because I mean, there's a lot of people there that had, that had experienced it, and they were talking about it, and I had experienced the same thing. And, uh, and it was uh, really uh, interesting to hear other people telling me what I was feeling. <laughs> but, uh, but the feeling is one of this, is that the synthetic Merkaba tends to produce many different colors within the Merkaba. And so, uh, and, they're, and they're constantly changing depending on what you're thinking and you're feeling, and also on your physical health. And, uh, but with the natural Merkaba, it's the same on almost everybody, and there was slight differences. There's a, it, 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 it is so smooth that you can hardly feel it. It just feels just like this. It, it, it just is very, very smooth. And it, um, it is a gold color, and, it, and I can see these much easier. And it looks like they're made out of gold, literally. But it isn't. It's just the speed at which and the way that it moves. Some people see a blue light associated with it, and what they're doing through my, uh, when I'm talking to them, trying to find out why, these are people that are extending their, their prana tubes higher to connect up into other levels within, their, within the range of their, of their entire energy field. And that, produce, that brings in uh, uh, prana from other levels of existence that is denser. Uh, uh, when you're practicing uh, Qigong, for example, you're, this Chinese method is really good, but what you're doing is you'll see them put their left hand usually behind their back, and they're pulling prana from nature, and then they're using it from, the, from their other hand. So they're, get, they're using third-dimensional prana. Uh, we are pulling prana from above and below and meeting in our heart chakra, which forms a sphere here and out to another bigger sphere, and that prana is fourth dimensional prana if it's connected one hand length above the head. Uh, I know that when China uh, investigated our method of qi, of not qigong, but of, our method of, of uh, teaching this, they began to say that what we were doing was just uh, Western qigong. We were pulling in the prana, and from there you can use it. You can do anything you can do in qigong. You can do using this system and you're pulling the prana from your heart chakra. It's incredibly dense, it's infinite, you never run out of it, and it's stronger than the prana that they're using from the third dimension. It's much more powerful. But you can even exchange that by extending your tubes up higher and connecting into higher dimensional levels. And that's okay to do. It really is. It's, it's weird. It's not okay to connect into those levels at our age, you might say, at where we're at in the evolutionary thing, because we're not prepared for it. But we can breathe from there. And so uh, some people do that. I did it for a long time, and now I decided to stay right here on this earth and move with you guys and, and use the same thing. And so I use a fourth dimensional prana also. But you might see a blue tinge in your sphere if you're, if you're doing something like that. Well, this is almost a letter. I guess I'll read it. It says, and I don't know who it's from. Didn't leave a name. It says, uh, Dear Jim Velo, I have been introduced to your work one year ago and have been watching many of your online videos. I have a question regarding the Merkaba and the upcoming Earth changes. In the last Q&A video, you mentioned that we really need to activate and become aware of our Merkabas in order that we will be able to recreate our bodies in the fourth dimension. At the same time, later in the talk, you say that everyone will be okay and will move on with the Earth into the fourth dimension and beyond. My question is, how will, the, how will those that do not become aware of their Merkaba be okay during this upcoming change? I know that most of my friends and family are not interested in the Merkaba science. This seems like a contradiction that I would like clarifi clarification on if possible. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I, I'm really, again, when I'm, when I'm talking about subjects and I'm not quite clarifying everything, these kinds of things happen. Uh, Ideally, you want to know their Merkaba, either synthetically or naturally. And, I de and naturally is, I is, is the ideal thing of all, and it's connected to the heart. Uh, but what does this mean when I said everything will be okay? Okay, in order to explain that, uh, 
there right now are three ways that you can leave this earth. Three possible ways. There may be a fourth one coming up soon. We don't know. It's possible. But right now, at this moment, there's three ways. And that is that you can either ascend, and, and if you... Well, let's start at the bottom. Uh, you can die. <laughs> you can just go through normal death. And the earth and the sun and the solar system has, is preparing for this change. And so for every last person on earth, this is your last life. You're not going to come back here again. You're not going to uh, resurrect again uh, unless you happen to get, squeeze it in between now and when we make this change. Um, but for most people, this is your last life. And if you die, uh, it, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. You're, you're simply going to go through a, 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 an unconscious death process that's going to lead you into to a very specific overtone of the fourth dimension where you will wait there until everything else is, everybody else is completed. Uh, and it's okay. It's not, it's not a bad thing. And the second way you can do it is through resurrection. And that example was given to us by Jesus. And resurrection means that you die normally, but after you're dead, between that two and a half and four day period when you're actually assimilate, assimilating yourself and preparing to leave, at that moment, you understand the, the relationship in life of what life is and how it works and you recreate your body there and you take it with you and you do that because you know that the body just like I was talking about everything is an image out there it's, it's just created by consciousness your body is just an image that you hold within your consciousness and you can recreate your body and you so and that's exactly what Jesus did he recreated his body and then he took it with him into the fourth dimension which allowed him to ascend consciously and to, uh, and to enter into immortality consciously. Uh, the way that's now available, a third way, is ascension. It's very similar, only you gain enough knowledge while you are an experience and, and wisdom and understanding while you are alive in this body. And then you uh, simply... At the, at a, you choose a moment. It's, you can re actually choose the moment when you do this. And you say now, and you do it. And that's taking the 18th breath. And when you do, uh, your body will become pure light. You can put your hands right through a wall. And, uh, and it'll build an energy, and you'll become this huge ball of light. And in a very rapid second, you're going to break down to a little sphere, and then you're, you're going to be gone. And you're, you will not exist on Earth your body will be gone. And, but you'll be in the same place as Jesus now. You're now in the death process. You're moving into the fourth dimension. But you're moving with your body, just like Jesus did. And when you get there, you will remain there, and you will be um, permanently there. Um, it, it really doesn't make any difference. But Now, why it doesn't make any difference is this. You've got to understand this. Uh, going back to the beginning of creation, uh, we were told from the very beginning to try all possibilities, all possibilities. It's as though God had never been in here before, and on one level that's true, and, uh, and wanted to know all the possibilities of this reality, what was possible. And so we were to try all things, good and bad, up and down, sideways, in and out, everything that we could. And today, right now, there are three ways to leave this earth. And, and it doesn't matter which one you use, really, because you're fulfilling that basic principle of you're, you're trying all possibilities. But some people, most people will die. Most, there will be probably a, maybe more people that do a, a, a resurrection, and there will be probably a smaller number of people that do ascension. But when you get there, you go into three different overtones. But once it's all simulated, we all move as one person, one living being. And, uh, and so it won't make any difference. But still, you've got to do the best you can do. The best you can do. If you can do it, you need to do it. Uh, if you can't make it, okay. But try. Try. Give it the best you can to see if you can. And you'll see that, that this is, you'll be rewarded for this in the sense that you will, be, you will have an understanding that will take those that haven't done this a little bit longer to understand. But God lives within every single person. 
uh, it is not possible for a spirit to be discarded or thrown away. It isn't possible because we, every single last person in the universe is important and essential for life. It's not the idea that we're just going to live here for a little while and die and just, that's it, it's over, is just garbage. It's not true. So that I'm, I'm speaking from my own personality and, <laughs> and how I say things. But, uh, uh, and so that's what I mean by it's, it's everybody's going to be okay. And, uh, but still, you don't just lay back and just watch the crowds go by. And you can if you want to. But for me, I want to give everything I got. I want to learn how to go as high as I can, as fast as I can, as far as I can. And it's my nature. Your nature may be different. You want to just lay back and watch the movie. We'll see each other on the other side. It'll all work out fine. Okay, I believe that's uh, all the questions and everything. Uh, and uh, I really want, want to thank you for uh, having the patience to, to listen to me for all this time here. And I hope it helps you. I really do. I hope that this understanding helps you a little bit makes it a little bit easier to understand what all of this is around ascension and resurrection and dying. And, uh, and we will do, if, if there's enough interest, if you want more questions, uh, I'll do this again. I'll keep doing this until you got it, if you want me to. Uh, but it's up to you. So you get, if you like it, then let me know. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I love you guys. Thank you. which may seem like 10 minutes later, but he's been gone for a long time because of the dif differences in the time ratios between the third and the fourth dimension. But uh, this is, th this one is, it's not a, it is, the reason we don't use it in, at, at this point in time in history is because it will not allow you to live on the fourth dimension. And we need to go from the third to the fourth and stay there to begin our journey, which we're all going to make. And so uh, the Merkaba that we are teaching now is perfect for that. Uh, there is no other Merkaba in existence right now that will replace this for the purpose of what we are about to do. I don't care what anybody says out there, there isn't. Uh, there's many other shapes, there's many other ways of doing it. They may, be, may even seem like higher ones, but they're no good for this, what we're about to do. We have to be in tune with Mother Earth. We have to, she has a Merkaba around her. That Merkaba is a star tetrahedral Merkaba, and NASA has met, now been able to determine that. All the planets have star tetrahedrons, Merkabas around them, and so does the sun. And, uh, and so the idea or understanding that I'm trying to give to you is that this particular Merkaba is the appropriate one because that's the, the environment that we are in is using that. And in, or, in order for for Mother Earth and Father Son to begin this mass ascension that's about to happen, we have to be in tune with her and we have to uh, be in the same vibration as her or we won't be able to follow her moves and, her, and, her, and let her take us into these other worlds, other Merkabas around your body. Uh, I'll explain this very quickly. There are, that are known and are stable, and I'll explain that, there are about 100,200 uh, other kinds of Merkabas besides the one that we're using. And, uh, and these uh, other Merkabas took billions and billions and billions of years for the universe to determine, discover, unfold, and live. And, uh, and they have been mapped and they know, and the, the universe knows and understands what they are. And uh, there are about roughly 500,000 more that are geometrically possible Merkabas, but they have problems. And some of these problems don't show up right away. There have been entire planets that have died from using a Merkaba that seemed okay, and then after maybe a thousand years, it changed in ways they didn't understand, and it killed them all. Uh, we, there have been many disasters uh, in, the, in the study of Merkaba throughout the universe. Uh, right now, we know what is stable. We know what will exas list forever. And, and, uh, and the one that we're using is one of those. Uh, it's only of the 100,200, we're only on the second one, two. <laughs> There's one more before this, which is a very simple one, which has been used by um, shamans and medicine men around the world for 
thousands and thousands of years. It's very simple. It's very limited. It will allow you to go into the fourth dimension, but only for a short amount of time. So it allows a, a medicine man to disappear right before you and then come back. Uh, didn't get to the bottom of it, which makes me go and research other stuff instead. Okay, well, the Merkaba is a very real thing in science. It is an electromagnetic field. It's not a thought form. Uh, it's not uh, uh, a, just a spiritual idea or a concept. It is an actual physical real thing in this third dimensional world. As it proceeds to other dimensional levels, it will change its nature. But here in the third dimension, it's, uh, uh, it is an electromagnetic field. This field sits at about four degrees Kelvin. That means about four degrees above absolute zero, which also means that it's a very weak field. In, in energy-wise, it doesn't have a lot of energy, but its power is in its form, its shape, and how and what it does. Uh, the, the full Merkaba of a human being is more complex than just the, the parts that we are using today to create it. That, that is a, the part that we're using is a star tetrahedron. It's a tetrahedron facing down and a tetrahedron facing up. And that's the first shape that forms out from around the body. Around that is a sphere that exactly encloses it. And then it begins with many, many, many geometrical forms that go out to hundreds of thousands of different possibilities. And, uh, and it ends at about 55 to 60 feet approximately, depending on your height. It's, a proportion, it's always proportionate to the person's height. And, uh, and the complexity of that requires computers just to be able to see it and understand it. Uh, Russia is very deeply into this. Uh, they use it in their defense system and their military. And, uh, and it is, uh, uh, on those levels, it is the most powerful force in the universe. Uh, there is nothing more powerful, even though it's a weak field, there is nothing more powerful in existence in terms of uh, protection and, 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 and creation and what a potential of what it is. The geometries that are in, around the body in the Merkaba are what are used to create the entire universe. And there is nothing, not one thing, in this entire universe that was not created through the geometries of your Merkaba. Even things that you wouldn't think. I mean, like if you look at crystals, it's pretty clear. You can look in there and you'll see that all the atoms will line up in geometrical forms and form crystals. It's totally a geometrical world. Or if you look at viruses, it's the same way. All viruses are geometrical, and they are all, you could actually see them through the microscope, and they're always geometrical. Uh, but there are other things uh, that you wouldn't normally think about, like feelings, like love and joy, uh, you know, or even anger. Uh, all your expressions that we have, those are also geometrical. It was Manfred Klein who was the first person on Earth to, to scientifically determine this and was written up in uh, different magazines and journals because of this, because the world didn't know that before that. But even those kinds of things are geometrical. And all of it, there is, without exception, everything in the universe was created through the Merkaba that is around your body. But not just the one we're talking about. There are many, many... Hello everyone, I'm Drumvalo Melchizedek, and we're here today to answer questions and answers again. <laughs> um, these questions and answers are coming from Facebook, and they've come in the last three or four hours, and they're all on the Merkaba. And so, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've been reading these questions, and you guys uh, have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, it's clear that you you really don't understand from most people here uh, what the Merkaba is. And so I'm going to do the best I can to try to explain this. Uh, I have a, an audio tape which will explain the history of the Merkaba and how uh, many things about it that, that aren't really understood out in the world too much. And so we're going to introduce that tape first and then these questions uh, that you have asked me right now will follow behind that audio tape. And so uh, I think between that tape and what I'm asking here today, I hope this really helps you more to understand uh, what the Merkaba is and its importance in the world. 
Okay. Uh, now, you, I've got names here from all over the world. I, I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce them all right, but I'll do my best. And this first one is one of the hardest ones ever. Uh, it's from a person that's spelled N-E-J-C. I'm not sure how to say that. Uh, but he says, uh, is the macabre something physical, spiritual, or more of a thought form creation? Because I've been meditating on it a lot, but I still 